All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the second panel of the day. Um, as you'll note from your conference flyer, the theme for this panel is personhood and reductivism. So that's an intentionally broad theme. Um, so I want to just say a couple words about it to motivate the panel before introducing the first of our distinguished speakers. Persons like you and I are distinguished by certain psychological features. We have hopes and fears and desires and loves, as well as certain normative features. We bear rights and responsibilities and are also subject to practices such as praise and blame. We are also, however, clearly biological creatures, and we have learned a great deal about ourselves in recent years through scientific investigation, especially, and most relevant to our purposes today, through investigation in neuroscience and the other cognitive sciences. And so we have these two perspectives on ourselves, the one provided by the sciences, the other provided by our everyday dealings with each other as psychological and moral persons. Our question for today, how are those two perspectives related? Now, because science can sometimes seem to provide a more objective or perhaps even more fundamental view of who we are, it can be tempting to suppose that the latter is somehow reducible to the former. It can be tempting to wonder, at least, whether personhood can be reduced to a set of physical, chemical, biological processes, or whether personhood is something over and above those processes. But if it can be reduced, what does it mean to say that personhood could be reduced to physical processes? If it can't be reduced, why not? Those are tough questions. Thankfully, it's not my task to attempt to answer them today. That job lies with our panelists. So allow me to briefly introduce our first. Dr. Susan Ross is a professor of theology and faculty scholar here at Loyola University, Chicago. She is the author of Anthropology, Seeking Light and Beauty, For the Beauty of the Earth, Women's Sacramentality and Justice, Extravagant Affections, A Feminist Sacramental Theology, and over 50 journal articles and book chapters. She is the recipient of a Louisville Institute sabbatical grant, the Book of the Year Award from the College Theological Seminary in 1999, and the Anne O'Hara Graff Award of the Women's Seminar of the Catholic Theological Society of America. She is past president of the Catholic Theological Society of America and served as vice president and member of the editorial board of Concilium, International Theological Journal. Let's give our first speaker a round of applause. Thanks, Joe, for that very kind introduction. Um, just want to make sure everybody can hear me if I speak like this. Okay, so um, I don't have a... Um, fancy slideshow. It's just me and my words. So um, I hope I'll be able to keep your interest here. So I want to thank the Hank Center for the invita invitation to participate in this conference. And um, I'm very honored to speak here. But I need to say that of the three people on this panel, I am probably, oh, I, I am no doubt the least scientific. So I'm a theologian, I, and I am embarrassed to admit this, but this is true. I have had no formal training in the sciences since high school, seriously. I was in college in the 60s, a time when distribution requirements were thought to be so very out of date. Um, so I never took a college-level course in math or science, which is kind of shocking. Um, but even in high school, I was tracked into the humanities, and I was told I should take Latin three rather than chemistry. So that's, that's why I'm here. Um, but I've always been interested in what science has to say. My fascination with the sciences has nevertheless grown over the years. I eagerly read the science section every week in the New York Times, and I try to stay informed as best I can as an educated adult. And I think I was asked to be part of this discussion because six years ago I wrote a book on theological anthropology and tried to take on some questions of personhood relating to the sciences in one of the chapters. It was the effort of an amateur, I will readily admit, but doing the reading for that chapter convinced me that there was a great deal for this theologian still to learn. Now last week, Steven Pinker, who's a professor of psychology at Harvard, and he's the author of The Better Angels of Our Nature, which is another kind of interesting take on these questions, he published an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education. I don't know if anyone else saw this article. Um, it was based on his new book on the Enlightenment, and he argued that humanists have been waging war on science to the detriment of human knowledge. He especially had in mind postmodern theory which has challenged the possibility of truth claims. 
His main point, though, was that the humanities have a great deal to gain by engaging more robustly with the sciences. And without going into his argument, which has raised questions online, I think it's fair to say that we humanists ignore science at our peril. This is not only to say that the humanities are losing out to STEM fields in higher education, although that is a problem, but that the division of knowledge into separate fields that do not engage with each other leads nowhere. So what I would like to contribute to this discussion today are some brief reflections on first my thinking in that book, um, and then some comments on theology and sexuality, and then some more recent research I've been doing on theological aesthetics, beauty here for Jim, and the relationship between mind and body. Now, as I noted in my book, for Catholic theology, grace builds on nature. That is to say, Catholic theologians, and not only Catholic theologians, take all of human knowledge seriously, or they ought to. And so what we are coming to learn from the sciences about the relationship between mind and body has a great deal to contribute to how we understand ourselves in relation to others and to the divine. So I'll just highlight a few points here. One is human uniqueness. Despite the protests of religious fundamentalists who reject the solid findings that we and other human animals share a common ancestor and that over the course of millions of years, we have evolved in physical and mental ways, uh, this is pretty well established. Although, I have to say, I was at a high school reunion last summer for my very tiny little high school class of 20 people, and one of my classmates was talking about how wonderful it was that Noah's Ark uh, replica could be found in Kentucky, and you know, all of this stuff, so I just thought, okay, you know, fundamentalism is alive and well. So we human beings then have a great deal in common with our non-human relatives, and medical research obviously knows this well, the theological idea of imago dei, I argued, is not a static reality that is found in our minds, but is rather a dynamic process of human beings opening ourselves to the world, caring for it as best we can with all our abilities, and reflecting on this place with both awe and lament. Maybe more lament in recent years, but the evidence is there. Another point is how we understand the emerging research on the relationship of mind and body. As I noted in the book, <clears throat> it seems clear that our ideas and emotions are rooted in our physiological makeup, but are they reducible to them? I don't know how one comes up with a decisive answer to that question, but it seems to me that the capacity to wonder, to ask questions, is not necessarily a reality they can be reduced to neural activity. And since I work at a desk and not in a lab, I have no scientific evidence to back this claim. But some of the theologians whom I've read who work in this intersection of science and religion, such as Philip Clayton and John Haught, argue that personhood cannot be reduced to physiological functions, although these functions cannot be ignored and that our trust in our questioning, reflecting, wondering is itself an indication that the impersonal and purposeless workings of the physical world, and that's, those are, um, I think those are Hot's words, are not a sufficient description of the world itself or the persons who live in it. But this is not something that can be settled, absolutely. But as a theologian, I'm very interested in the kinds of normative claims that both religious traditions and the sciences make and the very real effects that they have on people's lives. So I want to say a little bit about two areas in which I have a lot of interest and a fair amount of research in which both science and theology, and about which both science and theology have something to say. Sexuality and theological aesthetics. Maybe not so far apart as you think. So first of all, sexuality. I was privileged to be a part of a book a few years back that my colleagues Patty Jung and Anna Vegan co-edited, and to which a number of us, including Jim Calcagno and John McCarthy and others, um, contributed chapters on the question of how God, science, sex, and gender relate. My own work was a critique of the spousal metaphor found in so much Catholic teaching on sexuality. In brief, 
this teaching says that God created humanity male and female, that God as creator is the originator of life and therefore most appropriately named father, that sex roles are given by God and that deviating from these roles is a violation of natural law. This is the basis for a lot of different teachings regarding women in the priesthood, same-sex relationships, and all kinds of other things. My own critique was a theological one, that this thinking takes one biblical and traditional metaphor, marriage, for this relationship and absolutizes it. Further, that there are plenty of other metaphors for the divine human and human-human relationship that have disclosive and revelatory power, perhaps more so than this one, which carries so much baggage. But as I was thinking about this panel over recent weeks, and also working on the course I'm teaching this semester on religion and gender, it seemed to me that what we see in this teaching is a kind of theological reductionism that refuses to take seriously what science has to say about the dynamics of human sexuality. That is, as we come to know more about how our sexuality develops, as we see evidence of a variety of sexual relationships in the non-human world, we cannot say for certain that we know for sure what the natural law really is when it comes to human sexuality. Ideas of male priority that appear to be rooted in outdated and mistaken pictures of conception, ideas of female passivity that are contradicted by microbiology, raise deep questions about how seriously Catholic teaching takes what it calls the positive relationship between faith and reason. Do we not see here a form of literalism, or better, reductionism, that refuses to see the complexity of human sexuality that oversimplifies one way of rendering relationships? And it is not only the inaccuracy of this theological picture, but the very, very real pain and suffering that this causes that concerns me. So reductionism in our understanding of the person comes not only from the scientific picture of humanity and personhood, but from the theological side as well. My second point has to do with aesthetics and theology and how some recent work in philosophical aesthetics has challenged me in my own thinking. In his book, The Meaning of the Body, Aesthetics and Human Understanding, Mark Johnson makes the case that all of human knowing and valuing is rooted in the body, which of course includes the brain, and drawing on a wide array of scholarship, including psychology and neuroscience, as well as philosophy and aesthetics. Johnson makes a strong case that the very structures of human knowing cannot be adequately understood apart from their rootedness in the complexity of our physiological functions. This is, of course, probably ho-hum news to the scientists here. But Johnson goes a step further, at least to me, by arguing that it is not just that human intellectual concepts are rooted in the body, but that these concepts are by, are, by their very nature, metaphorical. That is, they operate on a fundamentally aesthetic level. So, Johnson says, to quote him, aesthetics must become the basis of any profound understanding of meaning and thought. Aesthetics is properly an investigation of everything that goes into human meaning making, and its traditional focus on the arts stems primarily from the fact that arts are exemplary causes of consummated meaning. Now, Johnson and others, like Jane Bennett, another philosopher interested in philosophical aesthetics, go on to argue that aesthetics has a significant role to play in ethics. Bennett argues that without aesthetics, Ethics is just a set of rules with no impetus to act. She makes the case that we need to cultivate a sense of enchantment, what she calls rendering oneself open to the surprise of other selves and bodies. This, it seems to me, brings us back to the question of how we envision ourselves in relation to the rest of the world and the role of wonder, of our openness to the unknown and of our willingness to be surprised. It seems to me that wonder and reductionism do not go well together. When it comes to sexuality, the idea that we can find in another person someone who can not only respond to our feelings of attachment, 
And here I'm thinking Rebecca will probably have much to say to us about the workings of our emotions when it comes to relationships, but who can also be a longtime source of wonder and surprise, seems to work against a mechanistic or deterministic idea of personhood. It is not that there are not mechanisms that facilitate these feelings. I am reminded of a powerful short story by George Saunders that I just read for the uh, Hank Center Reading Group about a futuristic prison where bi biochemicals are used to find how they can direct people's emotions. Um, I forget the title of it, but yes, yes, thank you. In some ways, it doesn't seem so terribly futuristic, but with the kinds of psychotropic drugs, try psychotropic drugs we have available. But without giving the storyline away, Saunders also seems to say something about the power of human resistance to this determinism and reductionism. And in considering the physiological roots of aesthetics, and I will just say as an amateur musician, this makes total sense to me, and there is a lot of work done in this area. I'm thinking of books like this is your brain on music. Um, the more we know about how the arts not only emerge from our bodies, but it also can work back positively as well as negatively on our bodies, it means we have to pay more, not less attention to what the sciences can tell us about how our minds and our bodies work together. So as a student of religion, as someone who works in a field that likes to consider itself a field encompassing field, as Gertz said about religious studies, it is a necessity that I pay attention to any discipline that can shed any light on what it means to be a person. But as a theologian, that is someone who seeks to understand religious faith, I am by definition someone who asks questions that push beyond the factual and the empirical. The new atheists would not distinguish someone who believes in something more than demonstrable reality from someone who believes in fairies. But wondering is not believing in fairies. My own sense is that the capacity to ask questions, to wonder, to reflect on the meaning of who we are and what life is all about, makes life itself a thing of wonder. Scientists and theologians alike do this, and that itself is a wonderful thing. Thank you.